have driven about an hour from Medora and walked for about 15 minutes. To through get a to, pretty muddy path today. Through was a, a muddy path today, <laughs> which is, to we've, we've never found it to be so before. Some kind of a gully washer rain came and just, just saturated the ground. Unusual for this time of year, but we made it because you know what? We have the right stuff. We're strenuous. <laughs> and so we are now in a very important spot for Roosevelt. And I'm just going to ask you to tell us about where we are and what people might hear and see at this Place. We're at the Elkhorn <laughs> Ranch, um, which was his primary home in the Badlands of Dakota Territory. He had a house built here. Uh, we're on one of the, the foundation stones. We're in the house now. We're in the west side. Uh, over behind us, ahead of us, is the, is the east front, and beyond that is the Little Missouri River. The river at the time was closer to the house. It, it shifts and moves around in its corridor. And so now it's uh, an eighth of a mile, maybe a little bit less from here. And the grass and trees have grown up in the interim. But in his time, it was right beyond where the house ends. Uh, and he has some photographs that he took of it. He was, a, he was a photographer himself, and he took some brownie photographs of the place. But he had this house built. He played a role in the construction of it. It was built out of squared cottonwood logs. And it then became the, the headquarters. And he wrote part of his um, books here. He wrote uh, a tribute to his uh, wife, Alice, here. She was beautiful in face and form and lovelier still in spirit. The sort of Victorian tribute, the only one that he ever wrote to Alice, he wrote here. And he had lots of descriptions of, of what it was like to be here, the books that were in his library. Uh, he talks about the veranda, which faced towards the east, and he had rocking chairs on it. And he said, you know, what American doesn't like a rocking chair? And he said, we'd, at the end of the day, he and his hired men would sit out on the veranda, and each one would take down a book from TR's shelves, and they would then read. And he'd say, in just a few minutes, I'd look over, they would be asleep. He'd say, because they, they worked hard, and they, they, their, their interest in reading at this point of the day was less than mine, but he would keep reading. Uh, it was just a kind of a sanctuary for him. It was a long, long, long way from anything. It still is. You really have to want to come to this one. And it's easy to get lost. You know, even now, you and I have been here many times. The whole way we were like, is that the turn? Is that How many turns are there? Because it's, it's remote and it's not well marked. And I love what the National Park Service has done with it, Sharon, which is to say virtually nothing. Yeah, leave it as it is. Preserve it in its current state. Um, ages again. have been at work on it, and man can only mar it. He said <laughs> of the Grand Canyon, but it could be said of, of this in many other places. And so around us, we have the foundation stones of the ranch house, which was large. It was not a cabin. 30 by 60, a big house, 1,800 square feet, yes. plus, a, plus a basement, in which he seems to have had a dark room, which is weird, but apparently true. They've done archaeological studies that suggest that he had an actual dark room here. So among his writing uh, about this place, I think he wrote about the sound of the cottonwoods, which is also something people can probably hear right now as the wind flutters the leaves of the cottonwood trees. Um, what do these cottonwoods mean and how old are some of these mm -hmm. near us? So Might they have been here when he was? The, yes. So you, you know, we'll pan around a little bit, but these cottonwoods were either not here when he was here between 1884 and 1890 or they were very young at the time so most of the mature trees that would have been here in his time have, have died there's, a, there's about a hundred 120 year life to a cottonwood and so it's possible that a few of these trees were here there are some nearby which were certainly young trees in his time but the experience is the same Mm -hmm. uh, so you are surrounded here. We're in a, um, a, a stretch of the of the Little Missouri River, and the river isn't fully lined with cottonwoods, but but there are a lot of them on both sides of the river, especially in these bottoms where there's a lot of uh, moisture. And so when Roosevelt was here, the experience would have been very similar. You can see it in some of the black and white photographs that he took. And uh, for those who don't have this advantage, we'll go quiet here for just a second, but. There is nothing more characteristically North Dakotan than the dance and the sound of the cottonwood trees when the breeze 
25, 26, 27 years old. He's just, he's just a kid. I mean, we now know that your brain is not fully formed until you're 25 or so. So he's still in his formation as a human being. And he had been a very sickly child. He came here to decide what he wanted to do with his life. He, he didn't have to work. He, he didn't have to, to be a reformist or a politician. He could have entered the family business. His father was an import-export man. Uh, Roosevelt could have led a life of complete leisure. And this could have been a tiny little interlude in um, a relatively textbook New York uh, upper class life. But he somehow just got under his skin in a big way and he thought, well, you know, who do I want to be? What do I want to do? What is the meaning of my life? What is the meaning of my life now that the two most important women in it have died? And those reflections well, his men uh, said that they were worried about him, that that he was too melancholy, and that he, he made statements uh, like, I, I don't see any particular reason to go on. The baby will be fine with my sister, Bammy. I, I have no reason to, to live. Um, my life has, has, has essentially been lived out. And, and Bill Merrifield doesn't usually get much credit for being a sensitive person turned out to be a great mentor, and he said to T.R., you're not always going to feel this way. You're not always going to be this low. You have to give this time. Uh, you're going you're to come back, and you should not do anything rash or even think rash thoughts because you're in the grips of this double tragedy. And it turned out to be, that was exactly right. And, you know, Roosevelt, as you say, would have healed probably no matter what because he was Roosevelt and, and the resilience of the human spirit is, is huge but but certainly he credited this place with his understanding of what it was to be an American and he knew and this is what I love so much about Roosevelt he knew that he and his class were not America they were part of America but they weren't America they were wealthy aristocrats living in a great urban metropolis with privileges that most Americans never could have had any access to. And so when he got here and he met very basic people, not very well educated, 
not very grammatical, not interested in opera or Latin verse. Um, very basic people. And he realized that there was a dignity and an authenticity and a, something really strong and vital in these people. And he thought, yeah, if I have to choose, I want to be more like that. I want to bring that into my worldview and not turn away from it and simply retreat to the class into which I happen to have been born. And this was not political posture. This was this was how Roosevelt came to see the world, and a lot of it had to do with this right here, his experience in North Dakota. And so this was first a place where he grieved. Mm. You know, each of us turns at those moments of life to different sources to replenish. You think he might have turned to his family. For him, this became a, a life source, if you will. Did his family find it so? <laughs> no. He did bring some of them. Bammy and uh, his wife, Edith, uh, he brought them here. And eventually, I think he brought a couple of his sons out here, and, and they all sort of understood why it mattered to him. But nobody, especially Edith, really uh, found it quite so compelling. I think she had a rough time. They, they arrived in the door in the middle of the night. Uh, then they, it was raining cats and dogs. They got in this buckboard and they were going through the river literally 23 times in and out at full gallop so they could get up and down these slopes. Water spraying everywhere. Roosevelt having the time of his life. Everyone filled with mud. She's probably scared to death and she wasn't easily frightened. And they got here and then they're here. You know, like, okay, so it's the middle of absolute nowhere. And she was a good sport. They went riding. She was a great horseback rider. She was a good sport. She was an ideal wife for someone like Theodore Roosevelt. But it just didn't work for her. It didn't. It was his thing, mm -hmm. and she got it that it was his thing. But it wasn't going to be hers. And Bammy, who had a had a physical disability, um, wasn't um, able to enjoy it in full. His sister Corinne was here, and she quote wrestled the calf, so she got into it in kind of a little um, full rodeo that the working men put on here. But no, they, nobody else saw it. And you know, when you ask, you know, what, where do you turn in that moment? Where do you turn in the dark night of the soul? So you turn to family, and Roosevelt had absolute support from his family. You know, of all the historical figures I've ever looked at, I found none whose family regarded him as they did and, and, and almost worshipped him. There was a reverence. There was a, they all uh, sacrificed whatever their needs were to, to, to serve the brother um, and child TR. And that's, I think, very unusual. And then, of course, people turn to God. And this is one of the interesting sort of perplexities that we have about Roosevelt because he, he's not really a very, um, he's certainly not an outspoken Christian. He, he, he was a nominal Christian. He grew up in the Dutch Reformed Church. He became an Episcopalian, thanks, I think, mostly to Edith. Attended church from sometimes, uh, but he didn't. He doesn't refer to the Christ or or God much. It is he has a largely secular way of seeing, uh, with a kind of a patina of Christianity. We shouldn't judge that. We don't know what his private devotions were, but he doesn't seem to have turned to religion as his solace at that time. There's no documentary evidence of that. And so what he turned to, to two things. He turned to these lonely places, and he talks about it. You know, there's no more melancholy place than a, a hot, still day on the Great Plains, and riding alone on a ridge, the, the cooing of the, of the doves, and so on. He, he turned to place, this, the spirit of place, and there is definitely a spirit of place here. And the second thing was kind of wild, sometimes reckless adventure. He threw himself into the adventurous life. He rode horses that shouldn't have been ridden. He, he would do two or three um, uh, sessions, you know, you'd do back to back um, labor during the roundups when everyone else was asleep 
and they would ask him if he would do a, a night ride around the cattle. He'd say sure, and he would. He talked about using up five horses in I think 48 hours, not, not killing them, but exhausting them. And he stopped stampedes. His horse flipped over in a stampede. He was thrown by a horse, and he broke the, the tip of his shoulder. And there were no doctors to treat that, so he just went on. He did a lot of crazy stuff. And you could say that he almost had a death wish. I don't think that's fair, but he certainly had a risk wish. And he later said, of reflecting upon this period, black care seldom sits behind a rider whose pace is fast enough. That's, I think, extremely meaningful. Black care seldom sits behind a rider whose pace is fast enough. And you just get the sense of this hectic pell-mell life and almost as if he's kind of outrace gloom or melancholia or grief or self-doubt. Um, so that was his other way of healing. And then, as you know, he went back to New York uh, from time to time to see his child and to publish books and to take care of things, to stay current in the, in the political world, at least to a certain degree. And at his sister's house, he ran into his childhood sweetheart, Edith Carroll. Um, and their love was rekindled and they were soon secretly engaged in, in December of 1886 in London in kind of a quiet, out of country um, wedding. They were married and that became, from an emotional stability point of view, that became the making moment of his life. And after that, <laughs> was not here as often, and, and he gave up his plans to center more of his life here. I think it's inevitable. You know, so we North Dakotans love Roosevelt, and we cherish that he loved us, and that he loved this place. And he did so much for us because he called attention to conservation, and we have the only national park named after historical individual, Theodore Roosevelt National Park. It embraces the world that he knew out here. Uh, he's, he's indirectly responsible for uh, the Little Missouri National Grasslands, 1.2 million acres that are protected by the U.S. Forest Service, which is one of his prime conservation agencies. You know, he, he, he gave to us um, the idea that there are things in the American West that are so valuable for one reason or another that they should be set aside and kept from routine human economic activity. And so we're in one of them. It's a 218 little enclave in the middle of the national grasslands. And it's been protected um, because of some conservation ranch purchases and some wise choices by the US Forest Service. Uh, but it's fragile out here. And Roosevelt uh, learned that while he was here. And he became that man, that advocate. And, and we are the direct beneficiaries. It is impossible to imagine the conservation settlement, the conservation package of the American West without Theodore Roosevelt at or near the center of that story. So we're the beneficiaries, but it just wasn't enough for him. He was a, he was a deeply ambitious man. He had a strong philanthropic commitment. His father was a philanthropist. And to those for whom there much has been given, much is expected, was almost a family motto. He was trained from earliest childhood to have a kind of a, a service mentality, that you serve humankind if you can. And so this wasn't going to be enough for him. It was great. And it changed him. It transformed him. It formed the Roosevelt that's on Mount Rushmore. But it wasn't a big enough arena for him. And so we use the excuse that he married Edith and she wasn't moving to North Dakota, and we use the excuse that his political life uh, was starting to have a resurgence. But really, um, there were when he came here, there were 39,000 people in the in what's now North Dakota. Um, it was extremely remote, small farms, scattered residents living in, let's just say, very basic conditions with a very um, slender culture because the work was just so hard to get through the winters and 
water the garden by hand and, and to plow the, the ground with a single plow behind a horse or an oxen. And so these, this world deepened his appreciation of life, but it couldn't hold him. And, and we should be glad for that. I mean, if he had stayed here, we wouldn't be having this conversation. He went back, and the, what he got here fueled him. It, it particularly fueled his sense that he, that that his class should not be allowed to rule the world alone, and it fueled his belief that average human beings have inherent value and need to be cherished and taken care of, especially those that are, can't um, assert their own rights and and. He, he became something much more, I think, than he ever would have been if he hadn't had this experience or one like it in another Western state.